rotator cuff injury. In this short presentation, I would like to provide you with the background in rotator cuff anatomy, injury, and possible treatment so that you may understand the nature of your own cuff tear and possible choices in treatment. The shoulder is a drumstick shaped bone which articulates with the shoulder blade or scapula. From the different surfaces on the shoulder blade, a series of muscles originate and then join together to form a cuff of flat tendons. This cuff attaches then into the lateral aspect of the shoulder. The top tendon, although the smallest, is both the most important as well as the most commonly injured. Due to its importance and predisposition to injury, we will, for our purposes of discussion, call this small superior tendon the rotator cuff. A bony arch called the acromion, or roof, covers the shoulder and protects the rotator cuff tendons which slide back and forth beneath its curvature. Over time, however, a bony spur may form on the front of this roof. As the spur enlarges, it may project downwards and over time may abrade, injure, and tear the underlying cuff tendons, a process called impingement. It is helpful to simplify shoulder anatomy by visualizing it in cross-section, as shown in this slide. This two-dimensional drawing illustrates the roof, or acromion, the rotator cuff muscle, the cuff tendon attaching the muscle to the shoulder, and lastly, the shoulder joint itself. The reduction of complex shoulder anatomy into a simpler flat, two-plane image is the basis of MRI imaging. This simpler approach to shoulder anatomy will be used throughout this presentation. The rotator cuff functions as a shoulder depressor. By holding the shoulder down, away from the roof, it creates room for the cuff tendons to glide back and forth. In addition, the cuff, by maintaining the shoulder in its joint, creates a mechanical advantage for the larger muscles of the shoulder and chest, making them stronger and more effective. Following a large or massive rotator cuff tear, the protective function of the rotator cuff will be lost. The shoulder, no longer held in its joint, may rise up until it abuts on the undersurface of the acromion or roof, causing weakness and pain. A rotator cuff tear is a disruption of the top flat tendon before it inserts into the lateral shoulder. Using our original anatomic shoulder drawing, one can readily appreciate the location of a typical rotator cuff tear. An important aspect of rotator cuff injury is progressive shortening of the tendon. This shortening, as we will see, has implications ranging from treatment choice to surgical outcomes. Importantly, whenever a rotator cuff tendon is torn, the end result will be a shortened tendon. This is true, as we will see, whether the cuff is repaired or treated conservatively. In the first step of a cuff repair, the outer remaining fragment of tendon must first be removed. In the second step, the remaining tendon with its muscle attachment must be advanced laterally into bone. Though repair saves the rotator cuff from further injury, surgical repair still results in some degree of tendon shortening. If the rotator cuff is left unrepaired, with time the remaining tendon will be repeatedly abraded injured, and shortened even further. The length of the remaining tendon, as we will see, has a profound effect on strength, motion, and re-injury rates. The remaining rotator cuff tendon acts like a crowbar 
giving an important mechanical advantage to the remaining shoulder and chest muscles. For example, the shorter the remaining tendon, the less strength is recovered following surgery. In addition, the shorter the remaining tendon, the more tension is required to advance it into bone. And as a consequence, the tighter the repair, the greater the possible loss of motion. Lastly, the more the remaining tendon must be stretched in order to advance it into bone, the greater the tension is placed on the repair site. It follows then that the more tension that is placed on the repair, the greater the likelihood of recurrent injury in the future. Our different expectations in regard to postoperative strength, motion, and rates of re-injury make it important for us to understand the large variation in size between different rotator cuff tears. All too frequently, patients are immediately greeted by friends and neighbors armed with exaggerated and sometimes horrific stories of their own rotator cuff problems. A fitting parable to help cope with these well-meaning folks can be found in the old story about 11 blind men and an elephant. In this parable, one blind man fills the animal's side and says the elephant is a wall. A second man fills the ears and states, no, that the elephant is like a leaf of lettuce. The moral of this story is that you need to come away from this consultation with an understanding of your own rotator cuff injury and not someone else's elephant. There is a wide variety of rotator cuff tears, from small tears to massive ones. We will use photos and videos taken with an arthroscope, a small telescope which is similar in size to a yellow pencil, to visualize the shoulder and investigate rotator cuff injury. In this slide, with the arthroscope placed within the shoulder joint, we can see the way in which a normal rotator cuff tendon attaches to the lateral aspect of the shoulder. In a similar view, one can visualize a small partial cuff tear. The tendon is seen chafed and abraded, almost as if the surface was roughened with a small wire brush. Partial tears are frequently asymptomatic and require treatment only if they become very severe. Here we can see a small full thickness tear, measuring perhaps one by one centimeter and marked by a minimally retracted but easily repaired tendon. In this moderate sized rotator cuff tear, the entire tendon has torn from its attachment on the shoulder, but only retracted or pulled away barely a centimeter. In general, moderate sized cuff tears are characterized by minimal retraction, leaving the remaining tendon very close to normal length. In order to visualize large tears, the arthroscope is best positioned just below the bony arch of the shoulder. In this position, one can look downwards onto the superficial or top surface of the rotator cuff. In this slide, the tendon is shortened and retracted halfway across the joint. In order to repair this large rotator cuff tear, the tendon would require significant mobilization, lateral traction, and extensive fixation. This slide demonstrates a massive cuff tear. These injuries generally involve more than one tendon and are characterized by severe rotator cuff injury and extensive tendon shortening. A large number of these tears lack sufficient remaining tendon length for adequate repair. The significance of this continuum of rotator cuff injury is that different expectations and outcomes generally follow repair of different sized tears. Following repair, patients with small and moderate cuff tears exhibit good motion, good strength, and enjoy low rates of re-injury. However, Repair of large or massive cuff tears may produce good pain relief, 
but are generally marked by restricted motion, limited strength, and high retear rates. At this point, I believe we have enough background to go ahead and discuss the actual technique involved in rotator cuff repair. In summary, in order to repair a torn rotator cuff tendon, the outer fragment, which does not have an adequate blood supply to support repair, must first be excised. Following this, the remaining inner tendon with its attached muscle must then be advanced laterally and secured into the shoulder bone. There are three steps in rotator cuff repair. This is true whether the repair is performed with open or mini open technique or whether it is performed arthroscopically. The steps include the following. One, excise the lateral tendon stump, roughen the underlying bone, and insert a series of small composite anchors. Two, pass the sutures held by the anchors through the remaining cuff. And three, advance and secure the remaining tendon into the roughened bone by tying the sutures. I repair cuff tears arthroscopically. Instead of larger incisions, small one centimeter portals are employed. The repair is performed through small plastic cannula with specialized micro instrumentation. At the end of the procedure, the cuff repair should look similar, irrespective of technique. At this point in time, I would like to discuss with you the options available to treat rotator cuff injury. The first decision one must make following rotator cuff injury is whether to undergo surgical repair or conversely begin conservative treatment. The natural history or what happens when a cuff tear is not repaired differs from person to person. The problem is we simply cannot predict who will do well with conservative care, and who will do poorly. In those individuals whose cuff is not repaired, there is simply little information available on how quickly different tears will increase in size, on who will have continued pain and weakness, and on who will become asymptomatic and do well. And importantly, who, although initially asymptomatic, will later develop pain and weakness in their shoulder when the tear is larger and more difficult to treat. Although we cannot perfectly predict the outcome of conservative treatment, there are important factors or variables that can help guide us in deciding the appropriateness of either surgical or conservative treatment. Age is an important variable. Obviously, the younger one is, the more time there is for the tear to enlarge and become symptomatic. Similarly, tear size is quite important. Small and moderate cuff tears tend to be associated with successful, long-lasting outcomes, whereas the result of repairs of large and massive cuff tears tend to be more inconsistent. Limitations in activity of daily living, work, and recreation are also important variables that must be taken into consideration. Lastly, pain is the most important variable. In short, if a patient does not have significant shoulder pain, it would be very unlikely for them to proceed with surgery rather than elect a conservative course. Conservative care includes physical therapy, a cortisone injection, anti-inflammatory medication, and importantly, time. The indications for repair include 1. Cuff tears in young individuals 2. Acute large cuff tears with significant weakness 3. Chronic tears where there has been a failure of conservative care, prolonged or severe symptoms, 
persisting work or exercise limitations, and finally, continued pain. Finally, outcome and expectations following rotator cuff repair. Following rotator cuff repair, pain relief is found to be good or excellent in 85% of patients. Strength, range of motion, and the repair rate depends upon both the length of the remaining tendon and its quality. Return to work varies on the amount of overhead work, power, and strength requirements of the job. The complications of rotator cuff repair include the complications of any surgery, infection, which is 1 in 100, nerve or vessel injury, which is decidedly rare, recurrent rotator cuff tears, deep vein thrombosis or even pulmonary embolus, and general anesthetic risks. Stiffness, which is more common in shoulder surgery, is a result of thickening of the tissue around the shoulder and may, if severe, require a second surgery at four months. Rotator cuff surgery is performed in the outpatient facility at Hackensack University Medical Center. Surgery is noted as arthroscopic and generally takes an hour and a half, depending upon other associated injuries. Anesthesia is accomplished by a combination of regional shoulder block and general anesthesia. Postoperatively, pain is treated with oral medication. Following rotator cuff surgery, a sling is employed between four to eight weeks, depending upon tear size. A formal period of physical therapy is required before full recovery is achieved at four to six months. I hope this presentation has been informative. In the ensuing consultation, I would like to discuss with you your MRI, your individual cuff tear, and the method of treatment appropriate for your injury. Thank you.